important to believe what the screen tells me. So uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this uh, episode of Dev Nation. We are going to talk today about credit card fraud detection and AI ML. So my name is Erwan Granger. I'm an architect, and I've been, uh, I've been at Red Hat since 2021, so nearly a year by now. And I'm going to let Audrey introduce herself as well. Hey, everybody. My name is Audrey Resnick. I'm actually a senior principal software engineer acting in the capacity of a data scientist. And I've been with Red Hat since 2020. Uh, beyond that, I was in the energy industry for a number of years, uh, acting as a data science, uh, scientist technical advisor. And before that, uh, in the dot com industry, also for a number of years in the capacity of a full stack developer. OK, all right. Thank you, Audrey. Um, so that's us, um, but I have to say we're also curious about you. Um, so we were thinking, uh, you know, are you a developer? Are you a data scientist? Are you an architect or any kind of other profile? So why don't we check if the chat feature functions um, and, and does what it's supposed to do? Uh, I can see some people have been typing already, so that's great. So if you don't mind, just type in quickly what your title or position is, and uh, this way we'll have an idea on uh, the types of profiles that we're talking to. So uh, take your time, do it whenever, um, just making sure that this functions. All right, so while you do that, um, what we're going to do today over the next hour, well, 58 minutes now, uh, we will use a credit card fraud detection example to illustrate AI ML processes and how Red Hat OpenShift Data Science fits into that. Uh, now, let's be clear, we don't want to teach you how to fraud, and we don't want to make you into a fraud detection expert, right? This is not the goal of the exercise. This is really just an example to illustrate you know, what it takes to do data science and what are the phases and, and steps, OK? All right, with that out of the way, um, let's kind of answer the obvious question. Why does fraud detection need data science? And I like to give as simple of a definition as I can. So if you're if you're a data scientist, if you're in the fraud environment, you will probably find it simplistic. Um, but essentially, I see it as two points. The first point is, well, fraud is costly, right? If you look at the numbers, it's costing companies billions of dollars, uh, and it's not plan to get any better. So this is not something you can ignore. You have to do something about the fraud. You cannot just, you cannot just accept it as a matter of life. So that's the first reason, right? But why data science? Well, um, if you're a developer, uh, you might think, well, you know, that should be easy. I just need to write if incoming transaction type equals fraud, then reject, else accept, right? This would be kind of the traditional coder slash developer thing. Um, obviously, this is not something you can do, right? If it were, then probably we would need data science for these types of things. You don't know in advance when a new transaction comes in. Is it going to be a fraud? Is it not? We can't have it coded like that. So that's where we call in the data scientists. That's when people like Audrey come, comes in and helps us with this. Uh, so essentially, instead of that, which is, once again, science fiction, uh, what we do is that we use existing data, maybe the past fraudulent activity that we have a record of, and the data scientist is going to build and train a model and the role of this model is to make a prediction, right? So we went, we just went from an if statement, which is very like, you know, is it true, is it false? Now it's a prediction. We are trying to determine the, the truth as close as we can, but it might not be 100%. So this model will make a prediction. Um, that model and that prediction essentially now replace our if statement, right? If we are coding a web application, we will then reach out to the model and say, you know, for this, given these parameters, do you think it's a fraud or do you think it's a legit transaction? So that's what the model is going to do for us. Um, now, however, uh, what might happen is that the pattern might change, right? If the people trying to fraud realize that it's not working anymore, they might 
change the way they do it. So what we've done, which worked initially, this, this training and all of that, may not work any longer in the long term. So if the pattern does change, then you need to be able to detect that the model is not as good as it used to be, no fault of its own, um, but the cycle begins again. We need to collect better data uh, based on the new patterns of fraud, and then we need to potentially retrain the model to make it match better with the new pattern. So I did say I wasn't gonna make you a fraud expert, and I think my very simple explanation here of data science uh, proves <laughs> my ambitions in that regard. So now that we've answered this question about why fraud detection and why data science, I'll just explain a few quick words about Red Hat OpenShift data science. So what is Red Hat OpenShift data science in case you haven't heard of it? It is an add-on uh, which you can obtain as a managed cloud service on top of your managed OpenShift. And you can read the complete description here, but essentially it's an environment where your data scientists can work and have the resources that they need uh, to put it in simple terms. Uh, we have this diagram, which I won't spend too much time on, um, but essentially we have if I can organize my mouse. So this is uh, powered by uh, AWS on OpenShift dedicated or Red Hat OpenShift on Amazon. And we have uh, tools like TensorFlow, Jupyter, PyTorch, which you might be familiar with. You might have heard of them before. Uh, we have a lot of things related to OpenShift itself as well. And we also have uh, not just this software, but also third-party software. Uh, you can see things like uh, Selden uh, and OpenVINO, those types of things. Anaconda might be familiar as well. So we want this to be a full environment that has all the tools that anybody in the data science uh, industry might need. Um, here at the top, we have kind of the traditional model of data science, right? I, I gave a quick explanation, but gather and prepare data, develop the model, integrate it, monitor it, and then retrain. That's ex essentially what I said earlier. And then we have the personas that are involved along the way. So the data engineer, the data scientist, the app developer, and then the IT operations along the way. So I, I am not a data scientist. I, I play one on TV or on Dev Nation TV, I guess. Uh, Audrey is. Um, so my role today will be just to kind of get us started and then um, Audrey will take over when we get to the real data science. All right, so um, instead of talking too much about Red Hat OpenShift, I'm gonna say, let's jump in and let's show you what this looks like. So what we're gonna do today, you, you can follow along if you want, you don't have to. You can sit back and relax if you prefer, that's okay too. Uh, this session is being recorded, it will be uploaded later. So if you wanna just watch it and then do this later, um, that's fine. Um, I'm going to paste that first URL here in the chat for you. Uh, there we go. All right, so I've pasted that first URL in the chat. You don't have to type it. You can just go there directly. And I'll explain a little bit what we're gonna be doing as an activity. So if you want, you can sign up for a Sandbox account. Uh, this is going to grant you access to one of our environment in which you can follow along with the presentation. The sign up process will take a few minutes. You have to have a Red Hat account, which if, if you've attended Dev Nation stuff before, you probably already have that. Um, and then uh, access the sandbox. So I'm gonna go through that. I'll clone the project that we're gonna be using. I'll give a very basic orientation around uh, Jupyter. If, um, if anybody here has never seen Jupyter, I'll, I'll show kind of the ropes of how this works. And then um, Audrey will take over and she'll talk about how do we start building and training this model? How do we test it? How do we deploy it? So that's the plan. Uh, let's get started. Okay. All right. So, okay. I've zoomed in my browser as much as I can. Hopefully, this is legible. So, this is the project that we're going to be using. Um, oh, in case you're wondering, 
R-H-O-D-S stands for Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. So that's uh, what we're doing here. So the first step here, I'm going to walk you through basically the, the basic setup of this. Uh, I will, since we only have six, well, 50 minutes now, um, I'm not going to read on screen all of the content. I'll just point out a few things. So if you don't have your own OpenShift environment with Rhodes installed, then I suggest you can use the Sandbox environment. So when you do, it's going to look somewhat like this. Let me zoom that in. Uh, try OpenShift Data Science in the Sandbox, that big button here. If you click on that, it's going to get you here. And so in my case, I've already signed up. Um, in your case, if you've never signed up before, it will prompt you to uh, follow these steps. Uh, so I believe here, if I just click Start, um, I end up directly in the interface. So this is what the beginning of it looks like. Uh, you can go slower at your own pace later. So for the beginning, I will follow the instructions that are here. So I'm told to use this uh, Jupyter Hub interface. So this is what we call the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science dashboard. Um, in the sandbox, that is all you will see. In a uh, normal environment, you would see much more. You might have enabled other software like IBM Watson, Anaconda. So here, the only thing enabled in the sandbox currently is Jupyter Hub. So I'm going to do as I'm told, and I'm going to launch the application. And I'm going to be met with this screen. So I, uh, I'm going to pretend that I don't know what I need to choose here <laughs> and scroll back to the instructions. So what is it that I need to do here? Uh, ensure that standard data science is selected. Make sure that you change the container size to small. OK, so I need standard data science and small. So let me get back to that screen. All right, standard data science, that's fine. Small, well, it was small or default, so not much choice here. Once again, this is because this is the sandbox environment. In a real full-blown OpenShift cluster, you would have small, medium, large, extra large. If you need 200 gigs of memory, you can have 200 gigs of memory. The sky's the, well, the cloud's the limit, technically. Uh, so this environment is just because it's the sandbox. So I've selected this. I've selected that. I think I can start the server. Do I need any environment variables? Let me see. Nope, nothing about environment variables. OK, so that should be uh, good to go. Let me get rid of that. And let me start my server. So at this point, what's happening behind the scenes is that a notebook is starting up. Um, and technically, if you know a little bit about Kubernetes and OpenShift, uh, really, it's a pod that's starting up with a container inside of it. And if you look at the event log, you can see that it's assigned to a node. And it's going a little bit too fast. I can't show you too much details. Um, and then my screen's going to refresh. And I will be in the Jupyter Hub interface, so Jupyter Lab in this case. OK, so this is the starting point. There is currently nothing in this environment. And what we are doing here is we are, we're trying to kind of fast forward through what might take a data scientist you know, hours or days or sometimes even weeks. So we don't want to start from scratch. What we're going to do is follow the instructions and clone the project. Uh, so it tells us here to use that Git icon and click Clone a Repository. And the window that pops up, we're going to copy the URL of that. So um, not very difficult. Let's just go here, do that. Clone a repository. Here, I'm going to paste the URL and clone that. Now I have a new folder that's been created. That's what was expected, so that's good. Uh, let's see what do the instructions tell us to do. Yeah, I saw that. That's fine. And then at this point, you should double click on the folder and then double click on 00, zero getting started. OK. So and you can see I'm like I'm at the bottom of the page. That's it for the instructions. The rest of the instructions will come from the notebooks. So let me get back there. 
double click on this. And OK. So yep, it did say there was going to be a getting started notebook. So I can see it here. So the good news is, if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, you don't need to look at this one because you probably will know all of that stuff already. Um, but just in case you're not, I'll go through some of the basics of it. Um, in, in I, I don't want to assume that everybody is, is familiar with that. And even if you are, I don't know, maybe you'll pick up a couple of things along the way. So a Jupyter Notebook is essentially a way to have in the same file to have essentially your documentation, your code, and the output. So this is a markdown cell. So if I press run, nothing happens, nothing happens. But this is a code cell. This is Python. And so if I press run, something will happen and the output will be displayed. Um, I tried The first time I saw this, I tried to guess what was going to be displayed. Um, it, yeah, I, I, I was not successful. So I'm just going to do it. And yes, this is this sure is fun, as you can see. Uh, I don't know how many of you would have guessed this, but indeed. So you can see now this cell was run, and then it had this output, and then this cell hasn't run yet. So I can also run this one, and then things happen. If you want to run everything in one shot, what you can do is click on this guy, restart the kernel, rerun the whole notebook. Um, this is uh, something I recommend doing uh, just to make sure everything gets run and from top to bottom in the right sequence uh, to ensure you don't have any surprises. And now you can see all of it is getting run and I'm seeing the output. Now, I've been using my mouse to do all of this. But if I was um, you know, developing or coding, what you can do is you can actually simply by using your keyboard, you can make modifications. And then Control Enter will run a cell without leaving the cell. So you can see Control Enter, I keep running that stuff. You can scroll back up. And what you can also do is Shift Enter. And Shift Enter will run the cell and get you to the next screen. So all of this that I'm doing, um, I'm not actually using my mouse to do this. I'm just using the keyboard. <laughs> or, or VI, yes. If you prefer VI, definitely that's that's allowed too. Actually, um, sorry, that comment about VI in the chat is, is a good uh, thing. Um, if you are a VI fan, uh, you have this launcher here, which allows you to also launch a terminal. So this, now I, I don't like to work this way too much. So what I like to do though, is I like to, uh, where did it go? Uh, not like that. I like it, there we go. So here you can have kind of the best of both world. You can have your notebook here and you can run the cells. And then here, if you want to, you can, use VI in this text editor. So this is just a standard prompt inside of your notebook, and you can access all that stuff. Um, so right, let's not have a fight over text editors, please. Uh, that, wasn't the, uh, that wasn't the intent. So what I like to do, I'm an architect. I like to do see how things run. Uh, I, I often do things like this, where I'm actually running top here on the right-hand side, and then I'm just running stuff here to see what happens, what's part of the environment being stressed out, and so on and so on. You kind of get the idea. All right. So the first notebook really is, is not anything to do with our um, our stuff. Um, so I'll just save that guy. Um, I won't show this, but this little Git plugin here is quite useful. You can actually do most of the things you need to do in Git right from here. So let's say you could look at a diff of what are the things that changed. You could stage your change. You could write your commit message here, and you could commit. It won't work here. Uh, and then you could even push back to the repository. So if if you're starting with Git, this is a, a nice, uh, easy learning curve for that piece. Okay, so I'm gonna I've done the zero zero getting started. So now I'm gonna put on my fake data scientist hat and I'm gonna start looking at the 
uh, exploratory data analysis. So this is uh, my way of getting myself acquainted a little bit with the data that I'm dealing with, okay? So um, let's start running some cells. Uh, what do we have here? pip install-r requirements.txt. Hmm, I wonder what this does. So if you're familiar with Python, you know that this is going to install a number of packages. And what packages you may ask? Well, those ones that we defined in requirements.txt. And you can see I have requirements.txt right here. So let's bring it up on the screen. And I'll just try to put it here. There we go. So these are the Python packages that I want, and these are their exact values. So I know that I'm using a known set of versions, and if it works tomorrow, it will work the day after, and so on. I'm keeping these versions. So that was enough. So these Python packages, okay, here I'm, I am using the mouse, but maybe I should use the, the VI key bindings, I guess, some VI fans in the crowd. Um, so import pandas, import numpy. If you're a data scientist, you know all of this better than I do. So here we're going to use the Boto3 client to download a couple files from S3. Okay, and okay, so now this doesn't look like it had any output. So you might wonder, well, did it work or not? Um, if I refresh here, oh, it beat me to it. I can see there's a new file that showed up, the fraud clean sample parquet file. So now I have my data file in the environment and I can start using data frames and I can start looking at what types of data do I have, for example. Um, I can see that the label variable has two values, legitimate or fraud. So that's going to be interesting. So this is kind of the historical data, what we've seen as legitimate transactions versus fraudulent transactions. Um, and we keep going down. So uh, where was I? Okay, the types of transactions. So we have chip and pin, contactless, online, swipe, and manual. Very good. And here we're going to have some counts. So how many online, how many contactless, how many chip and pin, that kind of stuff. Um, so these numbers are interesting, but we might want to graph this stuff a little bit. So I'm going to go there and, okay. For example, in this historical data, we can look at the fraud here, which is blue and the legitimate. And then we match it to the transaction type chip and pin, contactless, manual, and online. So we can see that, you know, from if we only look at this, there's a lot more fraud with manual and online, right? There's more fraud than legit versus swipe, chip and pin, and contactless. There seems to be less fraud. So do we go, all right, job done. We reject all the manual and all the online transactions, and then we can call it a day. No, right? We've just looked at one piece of the data. We're just getting ourselves acquainted with this. Um, so you have another thing, the uh, fo foreign versus, um, well, I'm guessing domestic or dependent on, on where you live. So where do most of the fraud happen? Well, by ratio, it seems to, it's mostly Transactions that look foreign are more often fraudulent. You, you get the idea. I don't need to dwell on that too much. Uh, transaction amount distribution. So let's look at that. Uh, so this is about whether it's more likely to be a fraud depending on whether it's a high amount of dollars or a low amount of dollars. I'll keep going. Inter-arrival times is, uh, let me see, the time gaps between transaction. So if you have five transactions in the same second, it's a bit suspicious. Usually people don't really shop that, <laughs> that quickly um, with their credit card. So here we, but once again, this might be your intuition. You need to look at the data and make sure that the data kind of confirms those uh, gut feelings. All right. Um, activity by time of day is also an interesting thing. I rarely use my card in the middle of the night. so the kind of the local time zone would have an impact. So for fraud, 
we see a very even distribution of uh, the time zones that the fraud transactions happen in. Uh, and whereas for the legitimate transactions, it's the distribution is, is quite different. All right, so that so far is the beginning of my exploratory data analysis. And then when I reach the bottom here, I'm told that, okay, now the real stuff starts. Uh, so we're going to click to 02 feature engineering. And uh, I think I'm going to slowly fade in the background and call in the real data scientist. Uh, so Audrey, would you like to take this over before I uh, make a fool of myself pretending to be a data scientist. Of course. So let All me right. go ahead and share my screen. And let me know if you all can see that. All right. So I just want to put some context where we are kind of in this journey. We've been uh, talking about looking at some of our data. I just want to flip back to one of the slides that Erwan had shown you early, earlier. What we're trying to do within a model life cycle are four distinct steps. We are gathering and preparing the data. Erwan actually looked at the data. As the data scientist, I'm now gonna go ahead and develop the model. There are gonna be a number of steps with that. And within our Rhodes framework, uh, we've been using Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. That's an ephemeral IDE that we're using. Some of you guys may have used PyCharm or Spider or some of those others. So I'm gonna continue uh, within Rhodes right now and let's take a look at the feature engineering. So once we've gone ahead and collected and cleaned our data, we have to look at the feature engineering. And what the feature engineering is, is it looks at processing that data into a format that the machine learning model will interpret correctly. Because we can't just put a lot of uh, text the strings into our model. That's not gonna be very efficient. Any of you who have uh, worked between transforming between data types, you know that if we have a numeric data type, uh, that'll be essentially a lot quicker than an alphanumeric or a character data type. So in this notebook, we're going to transform our data and we're going to ensure that the data still holds the information to kind of distinguish between legitimate and fraudulent transactions. Now, remember, we had to to do this, we have to remember kind of what our transaction data look like. So as Erwan mentioned, we had transaction times, you know, how long has it been since the last transaction was initiated, transaction amounts, transaction types, was it in person, online, contactless, um, were merchant IDs used, and other details, like where was the transaction made? Are you having transactions made both in Europe and North America at the same time? It might be a little bit difficult. So that could point to kind of a fraudulent transaction. So we take all of this information and we encode it as just a point in space. And we call these points feature vectors. And this is really important because from feature engineering, when we move on to the model, we can think of the machine learning model sort of as a function that's going to take these feature in ve uh, vectors and basically return a prediction, right? Because we have to be able to take all of the human type language that we've been looking at to uh, determine if we have fraud detection and transfer that into a binary language that our machine learning model can understand. In our case, when we go and take that machine learning model and it takes in that feature uh, vector, um, the model's gonna return a label. And that's gonna predict whether we have a fraudulent or a legitimate transaction. And I know that that's a lot. If you're data scientists, you'll dig this. If you're de or developers, you'll go, okay, what next? Well, let's go ahead um, and kind of go through the notebook. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're gonna obviously go ahead and uh, load the data. We're using Parquet. Uh, you can use CSV files, but Parquet is maybe a little more useful in terms that it has the metadata stored and your schema stored or your schema stored in your metadata. When you get a CSV file, you don't have that. You have to kind of guess what the schema is by taking a look at what columns you have. And once we've gone ahead and loaded our data, we want to go ahead and train um, and have training data and testing data. So we're gonna split that data into two parts. And we'll just show you here 
the, uh, the length of um, the amount of training data that we have is over a million and the testing data is um, around 600,000. And then we're just looking at the proportion of, of our training to our, um, our test data. So once we've got our data loaded, um, we could say that some of our features are very obvious quantities. We talked about interval times and transaction amounts, but others are categories of things like the merchant IDs and transaction types, which again brings me to that reference where we're using alphanumeric characters. Um, that's not really easy to deal with. And if we use conventional programming, I used to be a Java developer, so I can uh, go ahead and refer to that. Um, I want to use distinguish small integers to the model ca categories of things. But again, trying to do that in to um, input into a machine learning algorithm isn't going to really work. So there are a couple ways that we can take that those categor categorical, categorical features and make use of them in the notebook. And we use two methods. We use feature hashing, and we also use um, one-hot encoding. And I'm just going to bring a screen over here to kind of show you. So for feature hashing, what we'll do is we'll take uh, terms like John likes going to watch movies, and Mary likes to watch movies too. John also likes football. So what we do is we take a term, and we can apply a numerical index. That's one way that we could do it. The other way is one hot encoding, where we just kind of represent those categorical variables as binary vectors. So instead of having um, a categorical number for say apples or chickens or broccoli, you can uh, replace that by a binary. And I know this again is a lot, but um, I do have to go through this because I mean, for the data scientists out there, you want to know what we're, what we're doing and what we're talking about. So going um, past the encoding and the categorical features, um, We've gone ahead and we're just going to go ahead and use uh, these different um, techniques for feature hashing and one coding. And then we're going to see, can we visualize them to make sure that they look OK? And this brings another topic that's a little bit esoteric, and that's uh, reducing the dimensionality of our encoded categorical features. So we have these features like um, going ahead and saying it's a merchant ID, and we transformed it into um, kind of a binary. But we need to be able to now point those plots on a plane. So we're taking all this text and basically stringing it down and saying we want to represent this as a point. So this means what we're going from, in terms of our data, hundreds of dimensions, um, or five or six dimensions, depending if we used hash merchant IDs or one hot encoded transaction types to basically two dimensions. Now, this process is actually very expensive in terms of compute and memory. So what we do is we only uh, sample a small amount of our data. And we look at two types of analyses to help us with that. The first is principal component analysis. And the second is what is called TSNE, which is T-distributed stochastic neighbor um, embedding. So we'll go ahead and see if we can visualize these categories. And we look at them, and we're seeing anything that has non-zero. And we're going, wow, there are a couple that are really high, and the rest are kind of low. And this is OK, because that just suggests that the first ones that we're looking at, the data points, were hashed to something within our first kind of five buckets or categories. And that's all right, because within the first five uh, categories, the transform of our transaction type um, is going to be either fraudulent or non-fraudulent. Um, so those vials will be high. It means that our visual categories are actually working. And when we go ahead and sum up all of the non-zero forms, uh, they come up to 5,000, which suspiciously, um, in our case, is the exact, num nah, exact number of entries that we took in our that we took a look at for fraudulent and legitimate transactions. So with that, we're going, OK, we are able to visualize all of this. Wouldn't it be just easier to say that if we see a merchant ID that kind of looks suspicious, can we correlate it with, with fraud? And 
Again, we're using uh, the principal component analysis to kind of plot the first two principal components of encoded merchants. So that when we go ahead and do that, we can think of that basically as mapping from, again, high dimensional space to the two dimensional space. And if we take a look at this graph and it is interactive, we can see there's really quite a lot of overlap between the, the classes. So we can't say for 100% that the merchant ID alone is an obvious way to differentiate between something that is a legitimate transaction or that is a fraudulent transaction. In that case, um, we, what if we use kind of a non-linear visual technique? So uh, because there was a lot of overlap, obviously the merchant ID isn't the obvious way to differentiate between the legitimate and fraudulent transaction. So a non-linear uh, visualization technique can be better. So the next uh, process that we use is called uh, T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding or TSE for short. And that learns the mapping from high dimensional points to low dimensional points so that the points are similar in high dimensional space would also likely be similar in a low dimensional space. So if we go ahead and execute this, if I can get this here. When it eventually comes up, we'll see that it gives a better representation, but there's still a lot of overlap between the classes. And we know from looking in that exploratory analysis notebook or, or EDA that the numeric features do contain a lot of information to help us distinguish between the classes. So let's see how we'll exploit that with our, our models um, in another notebook coming up. But first, let's go ahead and process these features. So we're going to encode these uh, features. And we basically need to input any missing values for things like the interarrival arrival times when a transaction was made. Um, for example, the interarrival arrival time might be undefined uh, for the first transaction of each user, since there was no previous interarrival arrival time. And we'll need to kind of scale all the numeric features to a constant range. And we actually do this using a pipeline facility um, that you can um, use from sklearn. So let's go ahead and we'll just encode the numeric features. And go ahead and fit and save the feature extraction pipeline. And just a little bit more on this pipeline. Again, we went from that data, we transformed it basically into points. Uh, we tried to identify um, certain points or features. Really what we're doing is we're kind of stating how we want each column from that original data uh, to be transformed. And that's to basically use these various techniques that I've talked about and put this all into one pipeline which we can then fit to our training data because we don't wanna do all of this exploration over and over again. So we go ahead and we train it, or sorry, we uh, create the pipeline and then we'll go on to uh, train the model on our transform data. Now, because of time, I'm not gonna go deeply into logistic uh, regression, but um, logistic regression is basically a statistical model. And in its form, it uses what we call a logistic function to model one binary dependent variable. But there may be more complex extensions that exist. And when we use it in statistical software, or in our case here, we're trying to understand the relationship between a dependent variable and one or more independent variables by estimating the probabilities. Again, that's done by our logistic regression equation. And all of this may seem like very esoteric things that I'm talking about, but at the end of the day, this type of analysis 
can help you predict the likelihood of an event happening or a choice being made. So does something pass or fail? Do I win or lose? Do I have a fraudulent transaction? Do I have a legitimate transaction? So we'll go ahead and load in our data and then we'll split our data into uh, training and testing sets. And then we'll load in our pipeline, uh, create our feature pipeline. But there's something here that also happens with uh, creating a model. It's now that we've gotten all these features and we have these classes, we have something called imbalanced classes. So that basically means that sometimes our training data set can contain an unequal representation of each of our classes. So in our data set, there are fewer than 2% of the samples that are fraudulent and the remaining 98 are legitimate, which is awesome for the bank, um, but not good for us when we're trying to make our model very accurate in pinpointing those fraudulent transactions. Because of this, we're told that we have an imbalanced class. And again, it can cause problems because if a model goes and classifies all the transactions as legitimate, it would be correct 98% of the time. And that high accuracy can think can trick us to think that we're having a model that is very good. We can do a couple things to tackle the problem. And today we will use uh, metrics and you've probably heard about weighty. And weighting is a good way to, to tackle this because basically you weight the samples um, and these weights will be passed to the logistic regression model to ensure that the model is penalized proportionally um, for making a miscalculation for each class when it's training. So we try to get a more realistic point of view. So we go ahead and we'll just compute the weights for each of the data labels that we had. And then we have to go ahead and validate our model Again, this will come into the topic of confusion matrices. Um, we have this model and we just trained to make predictions for data in our test data set. And we wanna compare those predictions to the truth. The model is, form, is uh, performing okay, but it's better as we saw at identifying legitimate transactions than fraudulent. So we use a confusion matrix to visualize kind of the accuracy. And essentially, when we take a look at the confusion matrix, we're going to go ahead and look at the predicted classes and the actual class. Eventually, I'll have a nice diagram that shows up. But when we take a look at the predicted uh, fraudulent transactions um, versus the actual fraudulent transactions, we'll start um, getting some values that we can, uh, can look at to compare at what our round, round count is and what the estimation of the value is. So we can see if we're predicting fraudulent transactions, the value is pretty good now, it's 0 0.90. If we predict fraudulent transactions, but those are actually legitimate, um, the value is quite low. And if we go ahead and look at legitimate transactions that are actually, um, looked at as fraudulent, you'll see that the count is also low, which is good. And then if we look at the legitimate transactions that we've predicted, we'll see that the count is pretty high. And this is actually good. We want to do this visual comparison. So we're going to dump anything, everything into the model so that we can save it outside of our notebook. Uh, and then we go ahead into actually creating a main pipeline. Now I'm running short on time, so I'm going to skip this part of the pipelines where we're creating that pipeline that will take into account all the algorithms that we use to kind of uh, go ahead and see whether or not uh, our model was robust enough and added in uh, weights. And I'm gonna go ahead to look at how we deploy the, the actual application. Um, because remember, we have this model now, we've determined that it's pretty good, but what we want to do is to be able to um, create a prediction function. We don't want to deploy a Jupyter notebook. We want to create a prediction.py file 
and we want to have it connect to a Flask application so that from the Flask application, we can feed it some transactions. And then the prediction function using our model now that is pretty good with all of the different uh, methods that we've used to analyze it and weight it properly should return either a fraudulent or a legitimate transaction. Oops, that's not good. And then we can go ahead, um, go ahead into the detection and I'll just uh, take a look at the Flask app. And that's just to show those of you who are developers, we're just calling ahead on our prediction.py function. And within our prediction.py function, uh, we'll be giving it a pickle file, which will uh, contain our, our pipeline. And then we will also be calling the uh, model for an actual uh, prediction. And if I go ahead and run this Flask app, It may not run properly because I think I may have lost the connection here. At the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to use um, either a curl command um, just to check on the status of our service. Um, so what it's going to do is it's going to hit our local host. Uh, it's going to go through our Flask app and uh, we're going to give it some information, some transactions, and it'll say whether or not that transaction is either legitimate or false. So the way that we go ahead and we package this, because we're using OpenShift, we're gonna go uh, into uh, OpenShift itself. And what we do is because we've saved everything that we've been working on into a GitHub repository, we could go ahead and import from Git and basically go ahead and build that application, whoops, build that application inside of OpenShift. Just one moment here. So what we'll do is we'll get the get repo. It's the road, uh, the roads fraud detection get repo. Um, in our advanced get options, uh, the contacts directory is an app. We leave the get references blank. Um, this will go ahead and detect an image uh, for Python 3.9. We don't want Python 3.9. We actually want to use uh, Python uh, 3.8 and UBI 3.8. And we're going to call our application a Rhodes fraud detection application. We're going to just deploy it I'm not going to create it because I've already created it. But what we'll want to do is once it's gone ahead and created, we will see that OpenShift will containerize our application and have it available on the public domain for us to actually go ahead and send a request to the prediction um, function that's available there. We do this by actually going ahead and taking the URL that was created when this containerized application um, has been generated by OpenShift. So we grab this URL and within our fraud detection workshop here, what we can do is then put in that URL and go ahead and give it a and of course, I didn't uh, generate all of the, uh, didn't include all the libraries that I needed. But we would go ahead and give that URL and then um, send it some predictions and see whether or not our prediction is, is true or false. Um, and I wanted to go through this quickly <laughs> so that we could have some time for, for questions. Uh, what I might do now is just bring both Erwin and myself on stage and see if anybody has any any questions at this point in time? Thank you, Audrey. So yeah, I'm here. I'm looking at the chat. So um, 
Yeah, I think we have 10 more minutes. So if you have questions, type them in the chat and we'll try to start answering them. Um, and then I'll check my environment to see if I can show what this looks like in mine. Mm. God, I'm just going to go back again here and just see if I can get this to. Yeah, I did this yesterday, so it may not. Address. It might be because I also lost my connection halfways. Um, so if you didn't lose your connection, Erwan, you might be able to go ahead and, and demo this. Yeah, you know what? I'll I'll just talk a little bit about this piece while we're waiting for questions. Um, so, uh, Kristen, if you could switch over to my screen. Thank you. Okay. So, right. So let's talk a little bit about this piece. So, um, everything that Audrey showed. Um, happened here inside this notebook. And notebooks are nice when you're getting started, but you, you can't move a notebook to production. So the result of all the hard work done by Audrey is essentially um, a little web interface, a little Python function that relies on the actual model that's been built by all these activities. So once that is ready, this needs to be put in a place where uh, a developer can reach it, essentially. So by putting everything here in this app folder of the Git project, and by doing the steps that Audrey went to to, uh, to do this, it kind of does a few things at the same time. Um, so I'm not sure how familiar you are with, with OpenShift and Kubernetes. Um, so I'll, I'll try to describe it quickly. Um, this application results in something that's called a build config, which is a way of building a container image. So it will build the image. And you can see here, I've, I've clicked that start build button a few times. Uh, so you can, if you make changes in Git and you need to rebuild, you can come here and click the start button. Uh, if you want to, you can also configure a webhook so it happens automatically and redeploys on the fly. Now, not only does it that, like creating a container image is nice, right? It's this unchangeable version of your model, self-contained. You can move it anywhere, um, but the image itself isn't that useful. You need to run it. So the next thing that it does is that once the image is built, it will bring up a pod of, uh, of this. And when I say a pod, it could be multiple pods if you have like a lot of requests and you need more than that. It also automatically creates a service on top of that, which is nice if you're in the same cluster. Um, but in this case, by default, it also brings up a route. So if my model has been deployed, yeah, OK, I got there. So right now, when I hit this route, it just says status equals OK, because I'm not exactly asking for a prediction here. I'm just like poking at the model. So it's like, yeah, I'm OK. So this is the URL that basically I want to copy this link address. Uh, I'm going to go back to this. Uh, which one was it? It was the packaging application near the bottom, I believe. Yeah, okay. just go to the yeah. very bottom there. That's it. And then Thank just you. replace. Yeah. So here. Uh, just a viable to hold the external name of my uh, route. And then, so here, what I'm going to do through this request here, uh, I'm passing some data, right? Here's the user ID. Here's how much money. Here's the merchant ID. And I want the model to tell me what the model thinks about this. So if I go like this, it goes, yep, that's a legit transaction. So I'm. <laughs> I don't know if it's a trait of my personality, but when I see this, I'm like, OK, that's good. How do I know it really works? And I know it's not enough, but it always makes me feel better to kind of tweak some of the numbers and go, how about now? Mm, still legitimate? OK, 
What about if it's foreign equals true? How about now? Do you still think it's legitimate? Mm, okay, it's still legitimate. Uh, what if I change the inter-arrival time? Whatever this is, if I make it five, how about now? You think it's still, oh, okay. Now I've tricked the model into predicting fraud. So, I mean, this is not how you test to make sure a model functions well, but that's a little sanity check that um, I like to do when I'm doing these things. And so here, all of this, all of this that I'm doing, I don't need notebooks anymore, right? This is running in my OpenShift cluster. This is reachable from anywhere in the world at this URL. If you know how the, what the URL is, you can pass it data and it will predict whether a, a transaction is fraudulent or not. Um, and because it's on OpenShift, uh, you can also scale it up if you need to. So right now, let me see, uh, details. So right now it's running one pod, um, but it's as simple as clicking and maybe, well, I might hit some limits in the sandbox if I, if I do this and get in trouble. Uh, but essentially by doing this, now what I'm doing is I'm spinning up more instances of this model. They are gonna be running potentially on different machines in my cluster. So now if there's lots and lots of transactions coming in, they're gonna be load balanced across all these instances and I get like the goodness and the reliability of, um, of OpenShift. So this is, we find like an, a nice way to illustrate like the job of the data scientist and the job of the developer are not uh, are not similar, but they do intersect, right? And this is a good way where a data scientist can get started here, use their notebook interface to get the ball rolling, get started. And then by simply pushing changes into Git, have it automatically upload um, you know, upload the image and run the thing. And then as a developer, all I need to know is that the prototype is sitting at this URL. And, you know, when we move to production, it might be a, a different URL, but they can start, you know, mocking up the access to the model. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully we didn't confuse you more than we need to. Um, so let's get back to the slides. Um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat. So I will assume that everything was crystal clear from beginning to end. Right, Audrey? You understood Absolutely. everything I said. I understood everything you said. <laughs> yeah, we're good. So um, to wrap up, uh, we want to thank you for attending and giving us your attention. Uh, this sandbox account, uh, I've seen some of you uh, did go through the steps. So thank you for that. Uh, that account is good for, I believe, 30 days, and at the end, you have the option to renew it. Uh, so by all means, feel free to go through all of these steps again at your own pace, whether you're a data scientist or not. It does help to see what you know data scientists' jobs are like, and vice versa. It also helps to see a little bit what's, what's Kubernetes and OpenShift doing and all of that stuff. Um, if you have questions, you can use the Slack from DevNation. We keep an eye on it. Uh, the recording of this session will be posted later as well. So uh, that's two minutes out. So I want to say a big thank you to all of you. And uh, I think we can uh, stop the stream now. And